Our uh, speaker this hour is Clint Yarber. Clint was born in 1978 in Mountain View, Missouri. He graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching in December of 1998 and has been preaching the gospel of Christ full-time since graduation. In June 2003, he married the former uh, Melanie Yong. <laughs> Long. Uh, they have one son, Joshua, and two daughters, Leah and Abigail. He currently is blessed to work with the Gospel Hill Church of Christ in Pottersville, Missouri, where he has been for the last uh, 12 years. This time he brings us a lesson, Voices from Heaven at the Fall. A few pe people had made mention of, uh, Derek had kind of piqued their interest uh, in my lesson, and you know, I was sitting there, and as he started to go through that, he looked at me, and I shook my head no, and it wasn't because he was getting into my lesson, I just thought I could cut five minutes off his sermon, and I wouldn't have to listen to him that long. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I appreciate him uh, so much, and the, the great talents that God has given him, and his willingness to use them uh, in his service. This morning, though, my subject is similar to that of Derek's because we are talking about voices from heaven, and particularly we want to notice uh, in this study for this particular time period, the voices that came from heaven at the fall of man. Of course, the fall of man is recorded for us in uh, Genesis chapter 3, and when we're talking about the fall of man, we're talking about when Adam and Eve sinned and the punishment that God uh, put upon them because of that. But when you read in chapter 3, you will notice that there are some voices that do come from heaven. Now obviously these weren't different people, but we're talking about the voice of God. And we know that because we read in Genesis 3 and verse 8 that they, that is Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I often wondered, like Derek mentioned in, in his lesson, what would it have been like to hear the voice of God? I don't know if God appeared to Adam and Eve in, in a physical form of some kind and spoke to them face to face. Uh, I personally don't think that's, that's what the Bible's referring to here. Uh, but there is an interesting statement about this voice or this sound of God uh, that came through the garden in the cool of the day. And that uh, last phrase, the cool of the day, that's translated there, uh, I, I'm not really sure why it's translated as cool, because it's, it's literally the word in the Old Testament that is used for wind. And so I envision that what happened whenever God spoke, there was like a breeze that came through the garden. The breath of God came to Adam and Eve. And at various times, whether it was in a physical form or whether it was uh, like, like I think it might have been, God did speak to Adam and Eve. Some of those things that God had to, to say from heaven were actually, they, they came to Adam and Eve in the form of a question. And that's not uncommon. When you read through the Bible and you read about times when God spoke to men and, and, and to various women also, He often would speak to them in the form of a question. Now somebody might be sitting in the audience or listening uh, to this lesson and think, well, wait a minute. Isn't God omniscient? You know, isn't God all-knowing? So why would God ask questions of men if He already knows the answer to it? And that brings up another interesting idea, and that is that questions aren't always for learning. Now, they can be. You know, they, they can be used to receive information. If you were to ask me to go out uh, to your car and to get something for you, there were some questions that I would probably have for you. I might say, well, what kind of car do you drive? And, and what color is that car? And, and exactly where in this parking lot did you park? I, I ask those questions because I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to receive information from you. Sometimes I think questions are used uh, just to ruffle feathers a little bit. You know, sometimes as kids and as a parent, I can appreciate uh, back when my parents were uh, dealing with us as children. And you know, the, the, the first time your child asks you, you, you tell them something, they say, well, why? 
You know, the first reply is very calculated. You know, it's very thought out. Uh, much detail is given. And then, then after you finish with this great explanation, they'll say, well, why? And then it, it just kind of goes downhill from there until you end up saying, well, because I said so, that's why. Sometimes questions can ruffle your feathers just a little bit, can't they? It, it's, it's something that's used by lawyers today, by uh, investigators and so on and so forth. Sometimes questions can be used to reprimand an, an individual. You know, for instance, as parents, there, there are times when, when I ask my children, didn't I tell you to clean your room? Now, it's not because I'm old and I've forgotten whether I asked them or not to do it, but it's, it's to reprimand them because I know that they have not done it. And so a question can be used in that form too. But a question can also be used to try to get a person to reflect. And that's what God did with Adam and Eve. God was not asking them questions because He didn't know the, the answer to those questions. He was asking them these questions because He wanted them to think for themselves. And He wanted them to think about their words and their actions and the, and the consequences that go along with it. And so this morning, we're going to study some of those questions that God asked uh, Adam and Eve, these voices that came to them from heaven, and we want to ask the question, what can we learn and what should we learn from these questions that God posed unto Adam and Eve in the beginning? One thing that, that stands out to me in these questions is, you know, God was interested in their position. God wanted to know where they were. You, you remember when Adam and Eve uh, sinned in, in verses 8 and 9 uh, of Genesis 3? It says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? What's your position, Adam? Where are you? It's very likely, again, that God used to meet with Adam and Eve in a regular place, uh, probably uh, a regular time. And so here is God. Whenever Adam and Eve hear God coming, they immediately rush to Him. And here is God, and He's in the regular meeting place at the regular time, but there is no Adam and Eve. You think they have run from the presence of God. The reaction of Adam is something that's, that's stunning. Think about this. It's not that he had never talked to God before. It's not that he had never walked with God, so to speak. It's not that he didn't know Him in a, in a deep and an intimate way. But rather, it is that he has sinned. And so now... Adam and Eve run and they hide. But God asked him the question, where are you? You know, that's a question that all of us need to ask ourselves, isn't it? Where are we in our relationship with God? What have we done so that we feel that we have the need to run away from God and, and to try to hide uh, from Him? And I think there are several answers that we can give to that question. The first one may be, you know, are you a pious person? Are you a religious person? Are you a Christian? Are you in Christ Jesus? You remember what Romans 8 and verse 1 says. It says, There is thou therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, it's interesting to me, back in chapter 7 Paul uh, of Romans here, Paul has dealt with the idea of the law of sin and death. And that is the idea that whenever we sin, whenever we break God's law, the law condemns us to eternal separation. It condemns us to death. But then he says this in verse 1. He says, Therefore, connecting to this thought, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who are Christians, for those who are a member of the Lord's church. The law does indeed stand against us, but we have the mercy of God through Jesus Christ so that we no longer 
have to stand condemned. What is your position? Where are you? You know, it's my plea. I don't know the hearts of every individual here, but if you are not a Christian, I say this in love, you need to be one. If you want to stand before God and not be condemned, you need to be in Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can do that is through obedience to the gospel of Christ. And if you've done that, where are you? You're a person who's standing with no condemnation before our God. There's an interesting thing that happens uh, between Adam and Eve. Remember, after they sinned, they sew the fig leaves together. And they try, the Bible says, they try to cover themselves. Now, you have to do a little bit of thinking and studying that word covering, but it's not just talking about covering their nakedness. It's talking about covering their sin. It's talking about covering their guilt and their shame. A cloak, so to speak, to put over that, to hide it and to mask it. And do you know what those fig leaves represent? They represent every feeble attempt of man to try to make himself appear right in the sight of God. There are people today who, who try to, to cancel out all the bad things that they've done by doing good things. And they do all these good works and, and people look at them and they say, well, aren't those great people? And you know what? They may look good to themselves. I think those fig leaves probably look good to Adam. I don't think Eve disapproved of them either. She probably said, well, that's sufficient enough. They may look good to us, and they may look good to others, but they do not cut it when it comes to that piercing eye of our God. The fig leaves would not cover their sin. And so God uh, made the provisions to do such. Now, we can be a pious person, we can be a religious person, we can be a Christian, or you could be a, a prodigal. You remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15? That All that word means is wasteful. He was a guy who took every blessing that his father had given him, and he took it and he just threw it all away. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, fear God and keep His commandments, or let us hear the conclusion of the matter, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of man. Why are we here? We're here to serve God. We're here to live for God here upon this earth. And if we're not doing that, we are wasting the life that God has given us. And we are wasting, we're throwing away the opportunities that God has given us to live in this great place, this eternal place that we're studying about, the place that is called heaven. And so what, is, what are we doing while we're here upon this earth? Are we allowing the, the empty things of this life to take away from our sole purpose for being created? If so, we are being wasteful. I want you to think about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were wasteful people, weren't they? They took this perfect world that God had given them and the perfect opportunity to live there forever and to have a close, intimate relationship with God and they threw it all away for nothing. I can't be too hard of them because I did the same thing. <laughs> all of us have sinned, right? Right? And I'm convinced if we were placed in that exact situation where Adam and Eve were, we would have followed the same path that they did. But it's a wasteful way of living this life. And so what happened? They were ashamed. They felt remorse for what they had done. There was this sense of guilt that, that led them to shun the approach of God and to have any interaction with Him. Remember or think about before how they might have reacted before they sinned when they heard the voice of God. Would they have leapt for joy? Would, would they have been full of excitement? Would there have been great expectation when they heard the voice of God? Would they have run to meet Him like a child runs to meet their father? You know, one of the things that I'm looking forward to whenever I get home is seeing my children. And do you know what I anticipate whenever I open that door? I anticipate excitement. I anticipate them to run to me with joy. You know what I don't anticipate? 
I don't anticipate them to hide from me. I don't anticipate them to flee from my presence. But do you know why Adam and Eve ran away? They ran away because they were afraid of punishment. They ran away because they knew what God had told them, the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And because they were afraid of God, and because they were afraid of the punishment that might come upon them, they tried to run away and hide from God. My friends, men are still wasting their lives today by trying to run away and hide from God. We do it whenever uh, we tr- stay away from church services. We do it whenever we don't read and study our Bibles like we should. We're trying to run away and hide from God. We, we, we do it when we allow or refuse to speak to our neighbors or to our loved ones about God. People do it today by denying the very existence of God and the existence of sin and guilt and, and the idea of a conscience and by stressing this physical world and science over the spiritual world. Men are no different today. They are still trying to run and hide from God. Where are you in your relationship to God? Maybe you're a person who's making progress. Maybe you've already obeyed the gospel. But you know what we have to do? That's not the end of it. It Heaven's not our home yet. Now we have to make sure that we're progressing in Christianity. We're growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You remember what James wrote in James 1 and verses 23 and 24? He said, If any man be a, a, a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. How are you progressing in your Christian life? You know, all of us have to sit down from time to time. All of us should sit down from time to time and evaluate our life that we're living for Christ. Are we making progress? How are we doing in our church attendance? How are we doing when it comes to the subject of giving? Do I see any room for improvement there? Am I using my talents that God has given us to the fullest capability and to His glory? Is my speech not what it should be? Do I need to do a little bit of work on that? You know what James says there? If you look at yourself in the mirror of God's Word, that's why God has given us this Word. We can take a look at ourselves and say, I need to make a few improvements. I need to progress in my Christianity. And if a person looks at themselves through the mirror of God's Word and sees that they're not making progress like they should, and they turn around and walk off and never change, James says that's a sad situation, isn't it? That's a sad situation for a person to know and and for a person to have been taught what they need to do, but yet they don't do it. It's a spiritual waste of our life not to act upon what we see and what we're taught within the Word of God. I think sometimes we try try to plead ignorance in this matter when it comes to how we stand with God. You know, sometimes you'll hear Christians say, well, I don't really know. I don't know what my relationship is, is like with God. I don't know what, what, what my position is like uh, with my Father. But we can know, and we do know. We may not like to say, but these are not hard questions to answer. And if we will, we can see where we are in our relationship with God. So God wanted to know their position. The second thing that stands out to me about these voices that come from heaven is God gets really personal with Adam and Eve. You know that? You you see that in this story? In fact, in verse 11, he said, Did you you eat of the tree that I have forbidden you to eat of? God knew that Adam had eaten of it, right? But... He wanted Adam to confess what he would done, had done. He wanted him to see the magnitude of his sin. And so we have to understand when it comes to sin, we've got to get personal, don't we? Because God is going to get personal. So how do we react when it comes to sin? Do we attribute our sins to other people? 
You remember what uh, Adam said after God asked him that question in verses 12 and, and 13 of Genesis 3? Adam says, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And so God turns his attention to Eve, and, and he says, What have you done here? And the woman says, Well, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Do you realize that, that between those two people, none of them stood up and said, It's my fault, I did it? No, Adam said, Well, the woman... You know, she was the one who gave me it. She was the one who told me to eat of it. And he really even kind of insults God a little bit, doesn't he? He says, the woman you gave me, that woman who was supposed to be my helper and my companion and, and my perfect mate that you made for me and gave to me, she's the one that gave me of the tree. And so when, when God approaches Eve, He says, well, what is this that that you've done. And she said, well, not my fault, right? The serpent. He made me believe something that wasn't true, and so I, I ate of the tree. Adam tries to blame God and Eve, and Eve tries to blame the serpent. But as men, we're not a whole, we're not much different than they were back then. How easy is it to blame others when we do wrong? How easy is it for, for us to see the shortcomings of other people, but not our own shortcomings? As Adam saw Eve's fault, didn't he? And Eve saw the serpent's fault, but neither of them mentioned their own shortcomings. As Christians, we have to keep an, an objective eye, and we can't allow ourselves to be like Adam and Eve and, and try to attribute our sins to other people. Are we analyzing ourselves? You remember what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5? He said, examine the elders, right? No, he said, examine the deacons. Or examine your preacher to make sure they're in the faith. Make sure they're doing what they, they should be doing, right? Examine yourselves. And do you know why that's the case? Because I can't control what other people are going to do. I can't control what the elders are going to do. I can encourage them. I can show them what the Word of God teaches, but I can't make them do one thing or the other. I can't control what the deacons do. I can't control what any other church member is going to do, but I can control what I'm going to do. And so the Bible says, examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Analyze yourself. But you know what we do? We do the, exactly the opposite, don't we? We analyze everybody else. And we, we look at everybody else's shortcomings and, and we say, well, the elders aren't doing this or they should have done that or you know, the deacons aren't working in that area. They're not giving the attention to this work that needs to be given to it. Or the preacher is preaching too long and you know, his sermons need to be a little more interesting. If we were half as concerned with ourselves as we are with other people, then the church would be a lot less of a critical place, wouldn't it? It doesn't matter what the elders are doing. It doesn't matter what the deacons are doing, what the preacher is doing. God didn't ask Adam, what, what did Eve do? And he didn't ask uh, Adam or, or Eve, what did the serpent do? He said, what did you do? Did you eat of that tree? And so God got very personal with them. The fact of the matter is we have to stand up and admit whenever we do something wrong. In fact, Romans 14, 12 tells us that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every one of us will have to accept the responsibility of what we have done in this body. And there will be many in the day of judgment who will be lost because of their failure to accept their own shortcomings, their failure to acknowledge their own sins. And so the question is, what have I done? And we have to be honest. We, we, we can't blame other people for our shortcomings. The only way that we are going to keep our relationship with God pure and our relationship with one another pure is to accept responsibility whenever we fall short, to admit it 
to step up to the plate. That's not an easy thing to do. I'll be the first to tell you. But it is a necessary thing to do, and it's what God wanted Adam and Eve to do. He wanted them to accept personal responsibility for what they had done. The third thing that you'll notice in these questions that that come from heaven is that God was concerned with their performance. Notice verse 13 in Genesis 3. He says, What have you done? Does God care what we do or what we don't do here on this earth? You better believe it. He cared what Adam and Eve did, didn't he? He he cared that, that Adam and Eve didn't listen to his voice and didn't follow his commands. And I think sometimes whenever we think about the idea of sin, we like to think from it probably uh, from the the standpoint of Adam and Eve. You know, one of the things that, that obviously that they had done, they had disobeyed the commandment of God. And sometimes we we look at that and, and we do something that God tells us not to do and we think, well, that's not too bad, is it? You know, what did Adam and Eve do? Well, they just ate a little bit of fruit, didn't they? No big deal. Surely that's not too bad of a thing. How many times have you heard people try to defend the idea, well, you know, I just took one drink, right? That's no big deal. Or a person might say, well, I just had one puff. You know, I didn't get high, I just, I didn't inhale, right? I just smoked. Somebody might say, well, I just missed a, a, a few church services, or I just told one lie. Surely that's not too bad of a thing. I just cheated on my spouse one time. No big deal, right? I only murdered one man. No big deal. Like I killed 20. Surely one's not too bad, is it? You know, the things that that make all those, those things bad in and of themselves is because they're things that God said do not do. And when we do something that God told us not to do, or when we don't do something that God told us to do, we have disobeyed the commandments of God. That's what makes it so bad. Because God said, do not do this. Well, we need to be careful that we don't minimize our sin. And I think sometimes we're we're guilty of that very thing. Not only did they disobey the commandments of God, but they brought death to the entire human race. You can read in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, God said they, that the day that they ate of the tree, that they would surely die. And whenever we do something that God has told us not to do, whenever we sin, do you realize we sign our own death warrant? We sign it. Not God. Not anybody else. We sign our own death warrant. You know, I mentioned how there's there's a tinge of or a hint, I would say, of how I think God or Adam wanted to blame God just a little bit. You know, you made this woman, you gave her to me. It's not entirely my fault. If you'd never made her and gave her to me, we'd be all right, right? But you did it. How many people do you hear today blame God because of their own shortcomings? And what I mean by that is. How many times do do people get caught in in certain circumstances or in difficult circumstances and say, well, why would God allow me to be here? When they don't look back at their own life and say, well, because of these poor choices that I've made, I've wound up in this spot. Or how about the idea of, of death or sickness or disease? How many times do you hear people in the world today say, why did God do this to us? And you know what the answer is? God didn't do it to us. Adam did it to himself. Adam signed his own death warrant. And friends, whenever we sin, we sign our own death warrant too. Nobody made us do it. Do it. God didn't do it to us. We did it to ourselves. Another thing that you'll find is that they destroyed their relationship with God. You'll read in verses 23 and 24 of Genesis 3, how God drives man out of the garden. He, he, he places a cherubims at the east end of the Garden of Eden, a flaming sword that turned every way to keep man from eating of the tree of life. Adam and Eve destroyed this perfect relationship that they had with God. Do you think ever, anybody ever talked with God or walked with God more closely than Adam and Eve did? 
Do you think anybody ever enjoyed a better physical environment here upon this earth than Adam and Eve did? They got to meet with God on a daily basis. They had God speaking to them. They got to enjoy time with God. But when they sinned, that was over. Their relationship with God changed. The point that I'm trying to make here is there are consequences that come along with our sin. There are prices to be paid. And one of those is sin will always destroy our relationship with God. You know what else happened because they sinned? They started a dispute. You remember in Genesis 3 and verse 15, God said, I will put enmity uh, between thee and the woman. In other words, He says, I'm declaring war. And now, Satan was fighting to keep man out of the favor of God, and now man was going to fight to get back in favor with God. The only problem with, with that is we couldn't fight enough. <laughs> we didn't have enough weapons. We didn't have enough soldiers. We didn't have enough firepower on our own. And so we had to rely upon God. But there was a war. There was a war between the seed of woman and the seed of Satan. Now I want you to think about that. Somebody said, well, wait a minute. Satan doesn't have any children, right? What was he talking about there? Well, he doesn't have any physical children, right? But he does have spiritual children. And our war today is against the foe. It's against the armies of darkness that we're fighting. It's against the seed of Satan that the battle is being waged today. And so there's a war that started because of this sin. And not only that, but you also read about uh, uh, this this idea of a, a discomfort that woman would experience in verse 16. Now sorrow was going to be brought upon all women. Now the pain of childbearing. I don't know how much pain, if any, was associated with childbearing in the beginning, but I do know this, if there was any, God said, I'm going to magnify it. It's going to be worse now than it, than it was before. And not only that, but there was also a desire that was placed upon the woman. In fact, you remember what God said. He said, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. I wish I had some more time to talk about this, but I'll just throw in my two cents worth here. A lot of people think this is a physical desire, and it's based upon the use of the word in, in the book of Song of Solomon, that now uh, Eve would have a physical desire for her husband. Friends, that physical desire is not the result of sin. Let me emphasize that. And it's not a curse. It's a blessing that God has given to us. I don't think it's the physical desire for her husband that he's talking about here. But if you go into the next chapter in Genesis chapter 4, and you'll read verse 7, it's same wording is used here when God is talking about Cain. You remember Cain's sacrifice was rejected by God? And God asked him the question. He said, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Do you know what desire means within that context? The desire that he's talking about here is the idea of a struggle between desiring to control and to master. Sin wants to control you. That's what he's saying. Sin wants to be your master, but you have to master sin. Its desire is to control you, but you're going to have to learn to control it. Here's what I think. I think that the desire of Eve was to control Adam. I think her desire was for him to listen to what she said and to do what she told him to do rather than to listen to what God said. I want you to eat of this fruit, she said. Well, what did Adam do? Adam obeyed the voice of his wife. Her desire was to control and master him. God said, now your punishment is your, your husband is going to master you. Your husband is going to control you, have authority over you. In verses 17 and 18, you read about the drudgery that comes upon all of mankind, mandatory for all of mankind. 
The ground will be cursed for thy sake, he said. Sorrow shalt thou eat of it. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. It affected a man's life and man's work. And everybody who's going to live or who has lived from the time following Adam uh, until this earth ends is going to experience this curse that God put upon this earth. It's hard work that has been given to all of humanity. I don't know what it was like in the Garden of Eden before the ground got cursed, but I would kind of envision it. You go out there and pick up a seed and you flick it with your thumb and you know it just sprouts and comes up and you got you got food. You don't have any weeds to pull, you don't have anything to worry about. God said, Oh no, not gonna be like that anymore. No, it's gonna be hard. You're gonna sweat trying to get food from this ground. How many of us have ever experienced, if you've raised a garden, if you put, raised a plant, you know, you, you invest all this time, you invest all this energy, and you invest uh, all these products into trying to make it grow. And you ever had all the hard work and the sweat that you put into it just not come to profit? That's what happened because of man's sin. There are consequences that come along with sin. It changes things. It affects people. And it affects relationships. I want you to look at verse 15, though. This is the culmination of the chapter to me, the the culmination of the, the voices that come to Adam and Eve from heaven. Because God had a plan, even though man had sinned. And God visited the sinners. You catch that? God was not in the wrong. He was not the one who had run away and was hiding, but yet He visited the sinners. He came to those who had disobeyed His Word, and He revealed to them that there was going to be a way for them to be reconciled once again. He said, I will put enmity between uh, thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You know what that's a prophecy of? Jesus Christ. You see, God said, I'm waging a war. Man's going to start fighting you, Satan. And one day, a man's going to come who's going to destroy you. Not the seed of a man and a woman. He said, her seed, the virgin birth. No ordinary man, but a man nonetheless. God in the flesh. And there's going to be a battle between you and He. And in that battle, you both are going to have some wounds, but He's going to get the better of you. He's going to stomp your head. He's going to destroy the power and the curse of sin that you put on mankind. But in the process, you're going to bruise His heel. You're going to crucify Him and kill His body. But you didn't kill Him. (laughs) You just killed His body. You know, we look at these questions and we say, well, why... Should I be concerned about some questions that were asked almost 6,000 years ago to the first man and the first woman? And the answer is because these are the questions that God is asking you. The very same questions that God asked of Adam and Eve. Where are you? What's your relationship like with me? Are you a Christian? Are you wasting your life on empty things here upon this earth? Are you progressing in your walk with Jesus Christ? Oh, don't think that God's going to overlook us. He's going to be personal with us, isn't He? There's going to be some one-on-one time when it comes Judgment Day. And we're not going to be able to say, well, it's the, you know, the elders, the deacons, the preacher. God's going to say, no, you. You. Are we going to step up and acknowledge what we have done here upon this earth. And you know what we've done, all of us? We've sinned. And there are consequences that come along with that performance. There are consequences that we have to face. That means, yes, we may have sorrow in this life. Yes, sin can cause us heartache, and and it can bring even sweat into our lives and curses and, and separation. But the worst thing of all, 
The worst consequence of sin is eternal separation, eternal death from God. Adam's reaction helps me to better understand our own sense of of alienation, if you will, from God whenever we sin. But God searched for Adam and Eve. And He reminds us that even when we sin, God does not abandon us. God comes looking for us. He comes calling to us. He continues the care that we ha- that He has for us. And He sent His only Son in the form of a man to kill Satan, to crush the power of darkness. So that as a child, when I hear the voice of my God, I don't have to run. I don't have to hide. I don't have to be afraid. I can be like Adam and Eve in the beginning. There can be joy. There can be excitement. And I can be just like a child running into the arms of a father who he hasn't seen for so long. Thank you.